Okay, uh, so uh, we are going to honor um, veterans today by having a two-part presentation. Uh, the first part will be mine, and it'll be a real brief introduction to how to research your ancestors who are veterans. And, uh, and then Robin Jacobson is going to weigh in with um, her presentation, uh, which will add some information that way and also be talking about the Women's Study Club and their role in establishing Memorial Park uh, in, in um, Friday Harbor. So uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen and go ahead and proceed here. And like I said, if you go, if you see the uh, icons of each of us on the right hand side, if you go to that middle square, that goes to speaker view and um, you'll hopefully just be seeing me. So let me begin by saying first off that uh, I am not a veteran, uh, although I really appreciate uh, all you veterans who are present and uh, all those who have served in the services in addition to the memory of uh, veterans who've died. Um, Robin was uh, nice to point out to me that in fact, um, Memorial Day is for veterans who are dead as opposed to Veterans Day, which is both for veterans who are alive and uh, deceased. So we honor the full, full amount of veterans that way. I'm gonna give a real brief, um, uh, uh, talk about uh, how to research your uh, veteran ancestors, but I'm going to begin with my father, who was a um, World War II veteran. Uh, his name, which was impossibly long, was John Scott Boyd Pratt III, and uh, born in 1921, died in 1990 here on San Juan Island. So he enlisted in uh, 1943, and, and uh, this is the official term in the armed services, you are released. And that was on March 13, 1946. And that's a picture of him actually in Kailua Kona in uniform. And um, he, uh, he told this amusing, he was actually in Honolulu during Pearl Harbor and um, was, um, uh, during the attack and was kind of near Honolulu and but on the outskirts and um, they were very concerned that the Japanese were not only bombing but actually invading Hawaii and so uh, according to the story he told they they got a bottle of scotch and an old uh, service revolver and went into the irrigation ditches behind a place where he lived and hung out there for about uh, half an hour until the mosquitoes really got to them. And then they thought, well, if they're gonna take us, they're gonna take us in our beds. So they went back to the house that way. Uh, here's a picture of him. Uh, he was actually in uh, MacArthur's uh, uh, staff and uh, he was in the uh, actual occupying army of Japan. Uh, in 1945. And the story he told was that um, they did an uh, initial landing party, including him, him and his company. And, um, and then there was a typhoon coming in so that the fleet actually had to withdraw from, from uh, the coast and go out to sea in order to weather the typhoon. And so they were last stranded there and were quite uh, freaked out about um, what might happen, but apparently nothing did. Uh, they were fine, and um, so they um, they actually uh, were were okay that way. Um, he has a whole album of photos, including this one, looking upon uh, an urban area that's been clearly um, really devastated in terms of uh, Japan, and then uh, this. Uh, picture near a plane um, by the beach. And I that appears to be snow actually, uh, interestingly there. Um, 
So the other side of my family is Lovell's father, who was Elmer Murray Richardson, born in 1917, died in 1979. He enlisted in 1942. He went to um, uh, Air Force uh, training and trained as a bomber pilot and served in the European theater, running bombing runs over Germany, Europe and Germany and eventually it was released in uh, 1946. And this is a picture of him with um, our uncle Bob, uh, so uh, Lovell's uncle. And it was uncle Bob who actually uh, helped him get through pilot school in terms of mathematics and a lot of stuff like that. So they're obviously in Paris enjoying a leave. Uh, and here's the uh, plane that they he piloted. He's actually right here, um, second from the left in the back. Uh, Elmer was a big guy. And um, there's his crew. And we have another picture that he wrote on the back of the actual identity of all these people. So again, here he is uh, as the pilot, the back row. So I'm gonna go through, um, a few resources that are available through the library and then some that are available on the internet and um, and then uh, and then what and then uh, uh, go through some other sources and then we'll go to Robin's presentation. So uh, what's great what one thing that's great about COVID is that the library is closed but actually um, the various resources that have enabled us to do um, online searches for no cost, and you don't have to be in the library to do that. So if you go to the upper bar of the library website onto online resources here and click on that, you will come to this uh, icons of the various categories and you click on genealogy there. And you will find uh, three things here. You'll find Heritage Quest Online, you'll find Ancestry, um, the Library Edition, and San Juan Island Heritage. So I'm gonna go to uh, Heritage Quest first. And um, a co basic comparison of Heritage Quest with Ancestry is that Ancestry is really the kind, of, kind of 800 pound gorilla, of the genealogy, online genealogy. And Heritage Quest has its advantages, but um, it's really, um, it's really uh, not, not as uh, thorough that way. Um, but I thought I'd go ahead and do it anyway. When you click on the Heritage Quest icon in that page, you will come up with this. And a little bit further down, you will see the various search things you can do. So you can go to this lower square here search military records and you'll come up with this page and I apologize for the kind of fuzziness of it. I was quite frankly a little disappointed by the military records available in Heritage Quest online. I, I, I haven't searched it thoroughly enough but there didn't seem to be very many uh, things available so I kind of moved on to Ancestry that way and the great thing as I said about COVID is that Ancestry has allowed the, uh, one to go into uh, their library edition from a remote thing. So all you need is your patron uh, library card number in order to actually go into Ancestry and start searching that way. Um, this is the Ancestry home page and you'll see at the top bar there, the uh, home trees and search. So I usually go to search first and you'll come up with a basic um, uh, template like this where you put in your ancestors first and middle names, last name, place where they live, birth year, and then you add in as much information as you can. But if you hover over the search thing, you will be given a, sol uh, a choice of various uh, collections. To and my usual default is that you do all collections um, this way, but um, you can go directly to military. And if you click on military, and again, this is a really fuzzy thing, but basically what that says is that it, it's best to get the name and you know, first and last name birth and death dates and any sort of 
military information you have in order to get it. And then you can see some of the categories that you will actually get information from. So you could get draft enlistment and service records, casualties, uh, soldier, veteran, and prison roles, pension records, histories, awards, uh, some news, disciplinary actions, and some photos. So you can't always get um, a whole bunch on people, but you certainly can get uh, quite a lot. I looked up under my dad's name, again, John Scott Boyd Pratt III. And so I came up with these records right away. Uh, one is the, his draft card under that name, John Scott Boyd Pratt, and the other was Jay Pratt. And so here's his draft card um, with his full name, where he was living at the time, his age, uh, who, was, who was the person who was related to him and, and, who, and where he is working and his signature too. On the lower thing under just Jay Pratt, um, I then came up with this record. And so it's, uh, you know, gender male, birth date is actually his birth date, death date, um, and what branch of the army he was in, and it gave the enlistment date and the release dates under that. So this is all pretty vital information in terms of going further into records that way. And these are part of what's called the Beneficiary Identification Records Locator System, the BIRLS, B-I-R-L-S. Um, so it's all um, pretty good. Uh, I will tell an amusing thing, as I said, his name was John Scott Boyd Pratt III. He went by the name of Scott, Scott Pratt, but when he died and the army wrote to him about his pension benefit, um, it was addressed to John Pratt, dear John. So um, I, all, I knew it was him, but uh, it was pretty amusing that way. Another uh, interesting uh, ancestry website is My Heritage, okay, um, and it's just basically myheritage.com. If you go into there and you go into the search historical records, you'll come across this icon in the lower right hand side. You click on that as military, and again, you will find a search page that is geared towards the military information. So you put in your first name, last name, birth, uh, what branch of the military you were in, in the place of year, residence, and so on, keywords. Um, so it, it's a, I find it a lot, a lot easier uh, venue to use. Excuse me. So the other uh, place where you can get uh, records in, uh, is by finding where your ancestor is buried. And there are several ways to get at this. One is called find a grave. These are fairly easy because the, the names are um, in the URL. So findagrave.com, billionggrave.com, internment.net, and then uh, in, in GenWeb, usgenweb, tombstones.org. Um, so these will, all of these will generate, if you put in names and dates, it will hopefully locate where uh, where the actual grave is. Hopefully there is some sort of grave marker there and it often gives the military rank and dates of service of, of uh, your ancestors. So that's a, a great way to do it. And I am not, okay, um, whoops. So uh, one final way of getting at, um, at uh, grave sites is through the D U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, you go under the National Cemetery Administration, and you can see on the uh, left here, it's a nationwide gravestone locator. So again, uh, last name, first name, middle name. If you can guess at where the cemetery was and then uh, date of birth, and date of death. Now this is um, mainly for um, locating a veteran who is buried in an official military cemetery. So um, I knew for instance that my uncle Dick who was Richard 
Richard Summers, uh, who was a Navy pilot, uh, was buried at Punchbowl, so the National Cemetery of the Pacific. And so I was able to put that um, information in here and, and his name here and bingo, I got uh, his actual grave site and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a pretty handy tool that way. Um, if you can get a hold of newspaper articles about your veteran ancestors, that's a great way to do it. Um, these are two from, again, from my father-in-law, Elmer Richardson. The left one is from the Germantown Courier, I believe it is, and the right one is from the Philadelphia Record. Uh, and that's all about him completing his 25 missions uh, uh, flying over Germany. And uh, an interesting story uh, in that he then uh, re-upped and, and proceeded to fly another 25 missions. So he was quite, quite the pilot that way. Uh, you can get at historic newspapers by going to the Library of Congress site called Chronicling America. And you will see under the select newspapers, you can select an actual thing. So uh, if the, again, the Philadelphia record um, is one way of doing it, or you can do it by state and just try to figure out what their hometown was. So theoretically, the hometown is recording some of their veteran, um, veteran activities that way. Uh, the other way is by getting a subscription and you have to pay for it to newspapers.com. And you can do a search up here. And in that search, you can enter the person's name and then under show advanced, you can actually do the place itself. So. I was doing um, all sorts of things like trollers in San Juan County or sturgeon in San Juan County or Fox Brothers and stuff like that. So you can do that nationwide in terms of people. Uh, final thing that I don't know enough about, but, um, but I suggest you try out if you wanna get really serious and that is Stars and Stripes, which is of course the official newspaper of the armed services in the US. And uh, here's their homepage. Uh, but in order to actually do the search of it, you have to uh, do a subscription. So uh, as I recommend with many of these plans, just, you know, if you're gonna do a very intense search, just get a monthly subscription, that's $8. And then uh, when you're through with it, you can cancel it, but you can get a large amount of information that way. Okay, I am through with my, um, my program and I am going to turn it over to Robin and um, I will unmute myself and start my video. Okay, and I'm going to mute myself and Okay. Once I get to the beginning of this, my internet connection is also slow this evening, unfortunately. But there we there we go. Okay, that's great. So I'm gonna hope that everyone can can see the first slide there. Um, I wanted to thank people for uh, for signing up for this this evening. Uh, the the really great thing about volunteering at the San Juan Historical Museum where I do is that uh, I have access to so much interesting stuff. And my passion is the stories of people because that's really the goal of genealogy research, historical research in a much broader sense. Uh, the statistics get us there and it's really the stories that, that can take us to a place where we can honor the lives of, of the people that we're, that we're researching. So with that in mind, I um, let me go back to that, that other one though I wanted to say that we were gonna look at fold three first. Fold three is a military only website. It's like Ancestry where they give you a seven day free trial. Many, many of the paid subscription sites do that. Um, fold three is, is really good. Uh, they're not gonna have everything. 
because no website's going to have everything, but they have things that other sites just absolutely do not have if you're talking about uh, military history of, of any era. This is one thing that I found on Fold3, a really handy chart to help you figure out if a certain person was eligible to serve in a particular war. So, you know, we people living modern day, we kind of think of, of those who um, have uh, either been drafted or volunteered for the service of, of a certain age and older. Well, you could be like, I don't know, eight years old in the Revolutionary War because the drummer boys were quite young. So you can have some surprising um, finds if you know exactly what ages people uh, might be eligible to serve in a particular war. So this is just one example of what you can find on Fold3 that is educational in a general sense. Uh, this one I really like a lot because it tells stories. So th these are user submitted stories about veterans. Um, I first discovered this when I was looking for the story of how one of my dad's cousins was killed in World War II. Uh, my dad and two of his cousins all went over at the same time. My dad's the only one who came home. And uh, so I, I was just curious about these two cousins. And so as luck would have it, somebody who is the son of the tent mate of my dad's cousin contributed an oral story, not the whole history, but a little story about what it was like on the day when, um, when his tent mate didn't come back the day that he was killed. And then he also added some pictures, uh, just pictures of, of them mostly walking into bars when they were off duty, but it was just such a find. And so, you know, th this is another great place to check Veterans History Project. With any of these screenshots that I'm gonna show, don't worry so much about uh, writing down the, um, the website address because you can just Google any of these and they'll, they'll just pop up. So Veterans History Project will certainly be one of those. Cindy's list, which some of you might have used in a general uh, for general categories. And again, don't worry about how to spell it because the Google goddess and Cindy are really tight together. You can spell Cindy's name any way you can imagine. Uh, and the Google goddess will, will take you right to the website. So Cindy's list is a huge collection, a free site. She says it will always be free. She does accept advertising. She does accept donations. She will never charge you, the user, to use the site. And uh, the nice thing about it, two really distinct things, you can drill down very quickly to specific records that are not on any other websites. She will have them all consolidated. So her big thing is providing the links. And uh, whether it's learning how to do a particular type of research or how to find certain records, she's got it here. Uh, the other thing that's really great is that her, the way that she displays links, they are really deep down in the search process. She swears that Google will never find some of these returns for you because she uses a, a different method of getting to the links. So Cindy's list is another one that I recommend for military research. We're gonna do the Women's Study Club now. And some of you have already seen this before, I think. I've given it a number of times. What I did for this evening, because we, we're adding in more information about the men whose names are on the monument here, is that I shortened the Women's Study Club history but we can't really do the monument. We can't cover Memorial Talk Park without talking about the Women's Study Club, uh, the beginnings of it and their whole history on the island and their impacts on our community. So uh, with, with that being said, I'm gonna start these slides. And if you think that you've seen it before, you haven't seen exactly this version. The Study Club movement was a national movement so it had national roots and it fulfilled local needs. The big heyday for the movement was the 1890s through the 1920s for them to be formed. The basic concept was very simple. 
civic involvement, charitable efforts, self-improvement for its members, and social, ga uh, social gathering place for those members. Women wanted to have the same educational opportunities that men did, and uh, they also wanted to contribute to society and to their own local communities in ways that were not fully supported otherwise. So these women from San Juan Island were thinking big and they were moving fast. In 1912, the Freddie Harbor Improvement Club was almost all men. The civic-minded women embraced the concept of such a club, but they had more than town improvement in mind. It was time to join this national women's study club movement. The next year, Island Women formed the first local organization that focused on lifelong learning for its members and philanthropy for its community. They started talking about improving the little spot by the waterfront that would blossom into a future memorial park. The Women's Study Club is born actually in 1913 because there were at least six mentions of the club meetings in the local newspapers, but the official organization date was June of 1914. They had those twin goals of self-culture and civic improvement. I love this motto, not what we give, but what we share. So they wanted to educate themselves first and then go forth and share that. The club created a place for the women to become more educated, broaden their minds on current events, improve public, public speaking skills, have civic involvement, and to practice philanthropy. The result was the longest running club of any kind on San Juan Island, 95 years. Fanny Lake Driggs was the club's first president in Friday Harbor. Uh, I did notice somebody logged on who's a direct descendant of Fanny, so hi there. Uh, I have to say of all of our portraits of island women who were movers and shakers, this is one of my favorite. Fanny's one of my favorite people and I just absolutely love this portrait of her. In 1917, the town looked like this, or maybe not. There is some discussion as to the correct year that this photograph was taken, but I think for our purposes this evening, we're just gonna say, We'll figure that out later. But approximately 1917, the town looked like this. Uh, the meeting minutes of the Women's Study Club noted an interest in taking over the, quote, little park at the foot of Spring Street. They wanted to take it over from the Friday Harbor Improvement Club. I'm sure the ladies wanted to plant more flowers, right? So these women think even bigger. Between 1918 and 1919, after the end of World War I, their plans expanded to work toward a memorial monument in, quote, the Little Park for the nine men of San Juan County who had given their lives in the war effort. During the war, San Juan County, which only had a population of uh, about 3,600 at the time, was represented by 133 men and two women in military service. With nine lives sacrificed, our county's losses were among the highest percentages in the state. Statewide, it was about 3% and uh, San Juan County was a little over 6%, pretty high. So in 1919, the study club members planted grass, flowers, and a fig tree in the little waterfront park, still called Waterfront Park. Some minute notes which have survived and thanks to the Women's Study Club members, who have donated a wonderful, huge box of their history, of all of their minutes. There are just so many records from the history of the club. They've donated all of that to the San Juan Historical Museum. So um, I've had access to that there. So thanks to them, we have these uh, wonderful little tidbits. So November, 1919, the minutes indicated that Mrs. G.S. Wright show another it shows another $3 paid for the care of the park. Still calling it the Waterfront Garden Spot. Lots of different names for it. The 1920 minutes noted some Memorial Fund donors. We're now calling it the Memorial Fund to, uh, to raise money to purchase a monument and put it in the little waterfront park. I noticed there's a donation from Mrs. Moran of Rosario. So people around the county donated. It wasn't just Friday Harbor. So on Armistice Day, November 11th, 1921, the monument is unveiled. 
By 1920, after two years of countywide county fundraising, led the Women's Study Club, it had grown to be officially the Sailors and Soldiers Memorial Fund. It had grown to be nearly $1,500 for a granite monument. The 1921 Armistice Day unveiling was marked by a large crowd and a ceremony planned by the American Legion Hackett Larson Post number 163. Captain Charles A. Turner, a Spanish-American War and World War I veteran from Everett was a featured speaker. What he said is often quoted, war and its cost to nations in human life, pumping the youngest and the best from our national reservoir of life has besides much sorrow and suffering, a burden of debt and taxes as an aftermath. The two memorial elm trees were planted the following spring, one for the army fallen and one for the navy fallen. So I went down to Memorial Park a week ago to get some current pictures. So here, here we've got one of, one of the first World War I memorials in the state. It is pretty easy to find uh, magazine articles, newspaper articles, sometimes in books, where it says that we have the first World War I memorial in the state. However, Mary Hill, uh, up uh, in the Columbia River Gorge around Goldendale, they opened theirs first for their war dead. Now, that was on private property. That was originally on um, James Hill property. This has always been on public property here. So even, even though the Mary Hill Monument was always has always been open to the public, it was originally on private land. So I think maybe that is the root of the confusion. The photograph on the right uh, is the original plaque that is part of the monument with the uh, role of honor for the World War dead between 1914 and 1918. Um, we're going to go through uh, each of, of the men's um, short bios, and um, that's going to be right here. So here's a picture of all of them together. You may have seen this in other newspaper articles over the years. And I'm taking them uh, row by row. So it's always going to be left to right if you're following around with following with with who's who. And I've written up some notes that are a little bit more lengthy, lengthy than what you're gonna see on the screen. So we'll start first with uh, George D. Elaine, 21 years old, Roach Harbor, US Navy, fireman second class. He died October 2nd, 1918 of pneumonia. Well, guess what? It was the influenza at University of Washington Hospital in Seattle. George was the hospital's first fatality of the pandemic. He was the son of Toussaint and Mary Lacroix, Alain. George left behind wife Josephine, a granddaughter of San Juan Island pioneer Charles McKay. Charles McKay, who of course raised the first American flag on the island after the British troops left in 1872. A son named Lawrence was born, born to Josephine just two months after her husband's death and one day after her grandfather McKay's death. Lawrence himself would later die at age 20 in a wood truck accident on San Juan Island. Uh, next is Harold Butterworth, 19, also Roach Harbor, US Navy, fireman first class. He died November 30th, 1917 of pneumonia at the Naval Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. He was the son of Levi and Mary Briarly Butterworth. Harold was the first from San Juan County to die in service to the country during World War I. Harold's brother, Walter Butterworth, served in the Marine Corps and returned home to the island in 1919. Fred Hackett, who is um, possibly one of our more well-known uh, World War I um, heroes, age 19, Friday Harbor, US Army, private expert telegrapher, he was killed in combat May 1st, 1918, near Montdidier, France. He was the son of Collins and Elizabeth Gard Hackett. He was the first from San Juan County to give his life on the battlefields of France. American Legion Hackett Larson Post 163 on San Juan Island bears his name. And we have a little bit more about him because uh, 
He uh, was buried where he fell in France. And about three years later, he was brought home to San Juan Island. And so this was on the front page of a journal at the time. The funeral was held in the Odd Fellows Hall and uh, the funeral itself uh, was described as one of the largest in the county to date. And the next row of them, we've got uh, left to right again, Walter E. Heidenreich, 24, Friday Harbor, US Navy radio service. He died October 8th, 1918 of pneumonia at training camp in Seattle. He was the son of George and Marguerite Beck Heidenreich. He died a month after entering service. John M. Jones, 23, Decatur Island, US Army private. Wounded at Meuse Argonne, France by machine, uh, machine gun fire from an airplane on September 29th, 1918 and, and returned to the United States. He died from the effects of his wounds on June 5th, 1919 at Camp Lewis, Washington. He was the son of John and Isabel Reed Jones. Bud C. Larson, 28, Friday Harbor, US Army, private first class, killed in action by heavy machine gun fire at Jeanne, France on October 11th, 1918. He was the last from San Juan County to die in combat. He was the son of Lars and Caroline Severson Larson, American Legion Hackett Larson Post number 163 on San Juan Island bears his name. And we have a few letters that uh, the Historical Museum has that, uh, that help tell the story. It wasn't just that you know this man fought and then tragically died, but letters came home afterwards. And this is a, a, a particularly poignant letter. It was written to the sister of Bud Larson, to Mrs. Leslie Anderson, October, 1918. Death was instantaneous and he suffered no pain. He was considered one of the best and most reliable men, beloved by both officers and men. The entire company grieves deeply. It was signed by Lieutenant L.W. Martinez, U.S. Army at Jeanne, France. France. I have to remember what country I'm in. Okay, our next row here, uh, we've got left to right again, Charles Lawson. And uh, this is not the Lawson family of San Juan Island. This is uh, Orcas Island. He was 27, U.S. Army, private. He was gassed at Meuse Argonne and died November 5th, 1918 at Nantes, which is close by. He was the son of John and Jenny Lawson. Two Orcas Island brothers were both killed in combat in the Argonne Forest of France. It took me a long time to figure out these two because they have the same father but different mothers. Uh, Voil or Fred Martin, 37, U.S. Army, private first class, died on October 3rd, 1918, the son of George Martin and his first wife, Amelia. Voyal B. Martin, 27, U.S. Army, Private First Class, died September 28th, 1918, son of George Martin and his second wife, Anna. American Legion Voyal B. Martin, post number 93 on Orcas Island bears his name. There was a third brother named Irving Martin who also served in France at the same time. He was a quartermaster in the Naval Air Service and he returned home in 1919. And we do have some letters. This letter was written to Mrs. Jenny Lawson, the mother of Charles Lawson. November 15th, 1918. You will be glad to know that the end came quietly and without suffering. Your son gave his life in his country's cause and was buried with, with full military honors. The cemetery is a military one located here in Nantes and it is kept in splendid condition. I am planning to put flowers on all the graves at Christmas. It was signed Alice Maxwell Apple, American Red Cross Base Hospital 34 in Nantes. And I was just really curious about her. I, I can't explain why, but I want to know more about her. And I finally found her. So here she is. It's, you can see that it's a page out of a family scrapbook. She uh, was, was there at the same hospital where Charles Lawson uh, was cared for, so she knew him. And this picture is actually taken in 1918, the, the year of his uh, injury and death, 
at the same hospital, base hospital 34. It's all you know written in, in this uh, scrapbook belonging to the family. Uh, there, yes, there's a goat in the middle, which is really not part of our story, but the notes at the bottom say that the soldier on the right smuggled the goat from Texas and brought the goat to France. Um, I don't know how. That's like a different slideshow, I think. But at any rate, Alice Maxwell was described as a nurse in, in the Friday Harbor Journal. She actually wasn't a nurse. She was an accomplished writer, a published writer, well known in the US for her articles in newspapers and uh, even in Vogue magazine. She decided at the, maybe not even the height of her career, but it was a very strong career that she was going to go over to France. And so she applied for, well, first of all, she got uh, brought into the Red Cross and then they, the Red Cross asked for uh, the US Passport Service to issue her a passport. She had been married for eight years and she stayed married afterwards, but this is just a, a like a two year thing that, that she did. And so I was just delighted to find more of, uh, more of the story with Alice. Here's another letter. And this one was to the whole family of Voyle Martin. December 26, 1918. His companions always spoke very highly of him. He fought bravely for three days and he was then shot in the head by a sniper. It was on the famous Verdun battlefield that he was laid to rest. It was signed Chaplain Joseph P. Toul, Bombac, France. Again, a clipping from the Friday Harbor Journal, a gold mine of information for local history, as is any local uh, history society. What, where, wherever you're researching, just please do remember their own local history societies, their local history museums. They just have so much information. Okay, so back to Waterfront Park. We've got uh, a motion has passed to rename Waterfront Park Memorial Park. So this happened on May 24th, 1922. Uh, this beautiful picture here was um, taken in the late 1920s. And uh, it was recorded with the name of the photographer. So I felt that that was important to carry that through. So photography by Wilbur Sanderson. This picture that was used in the library promotion was taken in 1938 during the Memorial Day ceremony that year. Okay, but back to the Women's Study Club, they still need a building. The picture that you see, you, you probably recognize it, uh, was taken in about 1890 of the Methodist Episcopal Church. So in 1922, the women start to think, you know, we can really do this. We can now, we know how to raise money. We know that the community supports us. So they start thinking even bigger about fundraising to, uh, to purchase a building. So they started the fundraising in 23 and the property went up for sale in 1925 and uh, they, the women were able to, to purchase it. 1926, for a total of $400. Mr. Talbot, who did not own the building, but he was representing the Methodists. In 1927, the club started renting out the building for events and other clubs meetings. The club was used for rentals and uh, for community events. There were uh, library, there were literary uh, readings, musical performances by members, comedies put on by children, guest speakers from local government, including Friday Harbor Labs and visiting scholars, et cetera. The topics ranged from government to classic literature, education, opera, home arts. And of course, fundraising dinners were held there as were wedding receptions, birthday parties, and anniversaries. So in 1975, a new era begins with uh, the San Juan Island Grange number 966 taking over ownership for $36,500. And the, I say that this is almost what the range looks like today. I took this a couple of years ago, but of course today there's some construction going on. So we're, we were just gonna go with the old picture this time. The community benefits of the sale of the Grange uh, allowed the Women's Study Club to invest the funds. And then that interest was used to support local college scholarships. 
So they also uh, had really wonderful um, philanthropic donations to, the, to Wolf Hollow, to the Mullis Center, youth groups, the Chambers Holiday Street Lighting Project, the Medical Clinic, the Community Theater, there are many, many others as well. And the Grange very generously agreed to allow the study club to use the building for monthly meetings until at least 1985 at no charge. Between 1990 and 2008, the Women's Study Club then rented the Grange Hall for meetings at a low cost, but the dues really needed to increase. Membership was dwindling as members grew older, moved off island, or became inactive. After more than 90 years, the demography of the club had changed. Younger members were of yesteryear. The club's membership fluctuated around 45 with around 20 active members in attendance at monthly meetings before it dwindled lower. I mean, that's a pretty average um, rate of activity for members, regardless of what the service organization is. The Women's Study Club ended its 95 year active era in 2008. One of the last speakers was Port of Friday Harbor director, Steve Simpson, who spoke on the port's role in trans of transportation for the islands. The remaining club funds at deactivation were dispersed locally to Skagit Valley College for scholarships. A latter year's history was written in 2010 by past president, Catherine Chadwick, for which we are very grateful. This completed the historical story that had begun in earlier years. The legacy of the Women's Study Club is huge. They developed strong civic leaders whose efforts produced much enrichment benefit to our youth programs and cultural experiences. They define the collective power to do good. There are well over $30,000 in local student scholarships because of how the women invested the money. And of course, leadership inspired generations of local young women and their families. Their generous donations of historical records to the San Juan Historical Society and Museum has advanced local history preservation. And the town of Friday Harbor awarded the Women's Study Club its Partners in Preservation Award in 2006. Here we see Virginia Van Camp and Terry Pratt accepting the award on behalf of the club. And here's a picture uh, of a closer picture of what they were holding up. It was for outstanding achievement in continuing preservation of Memorial Park. And today it's a most treasured memorial. It's preserved in the town's register of historic places. I took a close up picture of the new, the relatively new plaque. We can see that on the left there. And uh, I'll, I'll read the names. These are are men who died in service in uh, the 1940s and the 1950s. Irvin Pease, U.S. Marine Corps, Bud Sutherland, U.S. Army, and Lawrence Larson, U.S. Army. So the Memorial Park is, is in many ways a, a living, continuing to, um, to honor and to, in, to evolve uh, important part of our community. A couple of close-ups. Uh, I, I really advise people to not just walk by it or not just drive by it. Um, I just sat in there for a while the other day and just, and I realized, oh, if you look straight up, you can see the American flag blowing in the wind like that, flying in the wind, which you can't, you can't see that in the summer because you can't see through the, the leaves on the trees. So remember them all at Memorial Park. Thank you, Women's Study Club members. They dared to think big. They helped establish an island ethic of community service and civic involvement. We salute them in recognition of their important place in island history. And now for the last section, which has nothing to do with the Women's Study Club, um, Boyd asked me if I would show a few of my favorite national historical parks or national history museums places that I have traveled to or places that are on my list to, to travel to. And then because we're in this era of COVID, uh, some, some of these um, museums are now open, but you know, a lot of people are just not gonna hop on a plane and go see them. However, what I did is I pulled screenshots of those museums and a historical park that allow you to take a virtual tour on the website or has some kind of a research guide on the website uh, or videos with stories on, the, on their website. So the first one, and this is like my 
favorite museum ever. It's, it's relatively new in Philadelphia. It's the Museum of the American Revolution, an incredible place. My husband and I spent probably 10 hours there, took a short break for lunch and just went back and looked at, looked at more. It's amazing. Uh, the fellow on the right uh, surprised me. I wasn't expecting to, to, to see this display coming around the corner. This is a Hessian soldier. I'm descended from one of those Hessian soldiers. And I really knew very little about them, but now I actually know what they look like. And this museum has George Washington's war tent. They have his original sleeping and office tent from the Revolutionary War. And it was carefully preserved for generations by uh, the Custis and Lee families following the deaths of George and Martha Washington. Uh, it's had a very, very long history. I've actually seen it twice because I also saw it at Yorktown before the new museum uh, pulled rank and got it. So Yorktown, very, very uh, sacred ground, very important to our, our history. Uh, if anybody's seen Hamilton the Musical, you know about Yorktown. So it's in Virginia. Uh, it uh, has what they call the Yorktown Minutes on its website. So it's a whole video series. Um, many of us have ancestors who were there with George Washington in Yorktown. Uh, my family has always known that we've had people there and we've always known that there was a great debt to be paid to the Marquis de Lafayette. In my particular family, there's a guy named Lafayette or maybe two or three of them in every generation since the American Revolution. So um, I was kind of curious about Yorktown and it's just an amazing place to visit. And Gettysburg, which I have not been to, but I will eventually get there. They do have a virtual tour on their website uh, and it's, it's, a, it's just really another good one. Now, a lot of us will remember that there's an island connection to Gettysburg because of our General Pickett, but I'm here to tell you that he's not the only one. The fellow on the far left where the arrow is, Thaddeus Smith, he uh, uh, served in the Union Army at Gettysburg. And so here's his picture with the other GAR members taken in Friday Harbor at about 1910. Um, I was curious about Thaddeus Smith and I lost him for a while. And then I finally located him in Port Townsend where he lived his really later years. And he's, he's buried in Port Townsend. And a, a fair amount has been written about him. So that's also our connection to Gettysburg. This is a good one. The uh, National World War II Museum in New Orleans. I spent a whole day there, wonderful place. Uh, uh, and uh, they have a great guide on their website, how to research a veteran. And of course, we're talking about World War II because that's their particular era. So that, that's another good one. And I'm gonna end because it's Veterans Day. Uh, I'm gonna end with pictures of my parents, my mother on the left, Helen Jean Preston was um, in Naval Intelligence in World War II. My dad on the right, Robert M. Forrest, he landed on the beaches of Normandy uh, Utah Beach, and then spent the rest of the war in France. And this picture was taken of him in France. They, um, they were both from the same small town of Wenatchee, Washington. They had nothing to do with each other when they were in high school because my dad was always in trouble and my mother was a goody two shoes. However, when a number of years had passed and they both found themselves going to the same baseball game back in their hometown of Wenatchee, they decided to say, well, you know, we both served in the war. We have this common bond now. And they were married six weeks later. So that's, that's the story there. That's the end of my, my show. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, thank you, Robin. That was quite wonderful. Um, I, Thanks. That, was, that was great, so. And it, and it was it was just so much fun to hear about the background of all all the um, the soldiers and sailors uh, that are memorialized at, at the park itself. It's just great to get that specific information. So at this point, I am going to ask yourself to unmute yourself and um, if you want to and uh, go ahead and ask questions. You're welcome to flag me down or 
do it in the chat box or do whatever way you want to do it that way. So, and oh, so I see Sandy Strelu, and I just asked her to unmute and. Um, Hopefully you can see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a question for Robin. Um, a long time ago, I was trying to track down that elusive, like who had the first Memorial Park, and I thought I I, I thought I remembered that Mary Hill began construction on their monument uh, before Memorial Park started, but they but Memorial Park. Uh, completed construction before Mary Hill. Um, am I way off on that, Robin? No, uh, and the confusion goes back to what part of Mary Hill? Because what the, and I just recently read this again to make sure that I was gonna get it right. Mary Hill dedicated its original section, which they called their altar uh, in 1918. And so the, the Stonehenge replica monuments were added later. And then there was a rededication. Got and it. that was in that was in 1921. So uh, I, I, I'm sure that that is where the confusion comes from. Uh, that, that centerpiece, which they did dedicate in 1918. My dad's cousin's uh, name is there on the stones. And so I, of course, had to go see. Uh, but I, I think that's it. And plus okay. the fact that it was on private land and our yeah. memorial has yeah. always been on public land. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so are there any other questions or comments? Well, you, you know, I actually do have a comment uh, because we're in this time of COVID <laughs> is, uh, with, uh, with so much attention now on the 1918 influenza pandemic, how, how much of San Juan Island or the county in general was impacted by that? And it wasn't nearly as great as the mainland, that's, that's for sure. But there were some cases that we did have here in the islands that ended up in fatalities. And it did start with the military, the movement of military troops and infections, et cetera. Um, I, I wrote down a couple of them. One in particular that I, I thought was pretty interesting and some of you may have known one of the people in this story. Um, this is a family, the Bellevue family. Some of you will recognize that name. Francis Thomas Bellevue age 21, died November 15th, 1918. She was the wife of Ernest Bellevue and the mother of their three young children, ages three, two, and two days. The family had recently moved to Anacortes from Friday Harbor, and then Francis died. The children were then split up. Uh, they were raised by their grandparents. The father, Ernest Bellevue, went to work in Oregon in the lumber camps. The two sons, Ralph and Robert, went to live in Seattle with their maternal grandmother, mm -hmm. Lena Thomas. Mildred, the one that people may have known here, the newborn baby girl was taken in by her paternal grandmother on San Juan Island. Her paternal grandmother was Harriet Watton. And so Harriet and her second husband, Rudolph Rosler, took in the baby girl. Mildred was raised here on the island. She married Joe Jasper and she died here in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, Norman Churchill, another uh, uh, well-known island name. He was 66. He died January 17th, 1919 of the influenza. He was the husband of Sarah Jane McKay who was the aunt of Josephine McKay, Elaine. And he was the father of four adult children. Uh, the last one that I'll that I'll use as an example of how it affected the islands was George Nicholson, age 39. He died March 12, 1919. He was the first husband of Letty Carter, who later married William Rourke. And he was also the father of five-year-old Marjorie Nicholson. Interestingly, the obituaries in the journal did not mention that 
people had died from the influenza. They didn't even mention that they had died from the flu of any kind. It just said an unexpected death, uh, a, a, a painful illness. There were any words other than it was the influenza pandemic. So um, not to be deterred, one must always look at death certificates, right? So I was able to locate the original uh, digitized copies of the original death certificates. And it's right there. It's on the death certificates. The cause of death was the uh, influenza. But the newspapers didn't report it that way. And so, you know, we'll never know why the family chose to leave that out. But my, I was just thinking, you know, it's a small place here on the island. And it was a much smaller place then, right? Maybe they didn't want to be known as that family that could be contagious. I mean, I, I don't know. But I, I did think it was interesting that the, um, the obituaries never mentioned it, but we we were affected tragically by that influenza here on the island. Mike. Uh, you know, the, the letters were uh, very affecting, uh, Robin, uh, especially the language. And what you, what you need to know when you read one of those letters is that uh, they didn't, the, the deceased didn't necessarily die not in pain. They didn't necessarily oh. die instantaneously. They weren't always universally loved by their fellows. <laughs> uh, th these, were, uh, these were standard sentences that had to be incorporated in any letter home by a commanding officer mm -hmm. uh, or a supervisor. And uh, so I recognized the language uh, instantly uh, when I it saw did, the letters, yeah. and I I hope uh, I hope that they did die without pain and death was instantaneous. But um, right. on the battlefield, that is always um, the the percentages are are very small. Um, yeah. The other thing was uh, Wilbur Sanderson. Um, that was a that particular photograph was one of the ones I found for the Friday Harbor book. It was in the collection of the Wacken Museum of History and Art, and uh, Jeff Jewell, who's the curator uh, uh, over there, uh, found that and several others. Uh, and that is a definite jewel. And the uh, steamer that's in the picture is the Mohawk, which was uh, built. Uh, in the Jensen shipyard. And uh, when uh, uh, it was really the second Islander, uh, the first one was built on Orcas Island. That one was built uh, right here in Friday Harbor. And unfortunately, uh, the uh, engines that they built for it, the diesel engines uh, were out of tolerance and it, it never, it was, it broke down so often they finally had to give it up and sell it to the Black Ball line uh, and Black Ball installed steam engines in it. And it's the Black Ball version. They renamed it Mohawk ah. and it has a Barlow steam elevator on the front of it, which uh, I, I found, well, I found it very exciting anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a very great picture and a, a lovely program, Robin. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, you too, Boyd. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, I wanted to add one little thing about the, uh, the um, and I apologize for my background picture, which seems to be very weird at the moment. Um, <laughs> but the Orcas uh, Lawson, in fact, was John Lawson, his wife, Jenny, and uh, she was straight Salish, uh, possibly Mitchell Bay. And so oh. um, that, uh, the son was so was half Indian. And uh, John Lawson was the one who lived in Deer Harbor and on an acre of land earned a full uh, farmer's living from growing rhubarb. And there's this wonderful picture again in the, this, this historical museum of uh, several men in a rhubarb field and you can barely see several of the men that field is so large and um, anyway, he shipped um, thousands of tons of rhubarb off Orcas Island in order to earn a living. I just, I'm, I'm wow. always astounded by things like that. So that That's was, that was their son. 
See, it's the stories that yeah. that make uh, that make it really, yeah. Uh, any other stories or or questions, comments? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is Bill. I'm jumping ahead to uh, World War II. My dad was in the 71st Division, and they got to Europe at kind of late, and they had to. Uh, rescue people from the internment camps. And so I wonder if there's any uh, of the World War II history sites that talk about divisions and what their purposes were and the members and things like that, that the actual function of the, uh, like the 71st division? Yes. Any places like that? Yes, yeah, def definitely. Just start Googling your questions about it and these websites will, will pop up. Awesome. Yeah. I think you'll find some pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, they, they saw some pretty terrible things, I'll tell you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. He never <laughs> talked about it, but he sure liked to go hiking and climbing a lot. <laughs> Get out in nature. That was what he did. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't drag anything out of my father. He just, uh, you know, if, if he could have, if he would have accepted some uh, some help when the war ended, he would have benefited from it, but uh, he was he was pretty messed up by what he saw too. Um, my mother used to roll up socks and leave them by the side of the bed so that when he would have a nightmare and uh, reach for a hand grenade and throw it, he was throwing a rolled up pair of socks wow. instead of the alarm clock because wow. he broke more than wow. one window. And so she just figured out a way to, to deal with that, having you know been a veteran herself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they saw, they saw a lot, didn't they? Well, yeah, my mother just died in 2019 and my sister's cleaning all the stuff out and he had all these pictures from that experience, all these black and white pictures and skeletal people walking around and, and they, they never showed it to us kids, you know, they had yeah. seven kids, but they never talked about it, told us about any of that. We never saw the pictures, but they still exist. So it was pretty bizarre. So Dave. Dave, Dave Zaretsky, and I, I just wanted to say about three years ago, I gathered together all my father's World War II stories. He landed in France, then worked his way through Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, and then on in towards Berlin in, in uh, Germany. And when I finally got those edited as a Christmas presents to nieces and nephews, I passed them on to my siblings for, you know, their opinion to see if my memory was halfway accurate to theirs. Well, of course, as he aged, the facts and the stories grew and changed and shifted. So we had a couple of versions, but we are always able to agree on the, the essence of them. And it was a fine Christmas gift for, uh, especially for his grandkids who never grew up around him. To, to take those stories. And I found it particularly helpful to go into a lot of the German sites because my my father, like Bill's, was there when there were some concentration camps open and, uh, and was able to research it quite well. But I'm looking forward to learn more about his mil military history because at one point uh, there was a fire in St. Louis, I guess, that burned up some records because oh, yeah. we tried to get some of his records and we, we got told that they were lost. Do you know about that, Robin Boyd? Yes, a, a, a ton of records were lost, just a ton. And so that's why these um, sites like the, uh, the, the memory history projects um, are, are important because we can, we can start to piece together some of, of the story by what the veterans themselves have written up and submitted, or you know, it might be one of their children has written it up based on the stories they heard. Um, maybe not always exactly accurate, but uh, there are ways to go around and try to recreate what was burned in that awful fire, but I don't think that we're ever gonna replace it completely. There's just a lot that was gone. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, assistant director at Veterans Affairs um, in the 80s, uh, we were uh, tracking down uh, veterans records uh, for their application for compensation. And uh, the St. Louis fire was a huge obstacle. 
And uh, we ended up, uh, as Robin says, we ended up doing ender rounds to get the information. It wasn't as uh, easy then as it is now. Google is a marvelous instrument. I use it all the time now. It's amazing yeah. what you can find on it. But there are ways you can go about, go about getting it. I think Robin would probably be more expert at that than I would be now. But um, yeah, that's it was quite a sad story. I'd like to add one thing about uh, my dad. Uh, my father uh, was 4F. Um, and so he uh, had engineering skills. So they, they made him an ammunition inspector. And he was uh, in the hold of a ship in Benicia, California. Uh, in 1944, when two ammunition ships exploded um, upriver in Port Chicago, California, the ammunition ships virtually disintegrated and took out the town of Port Chicago and uh, uh, 100 guys uh, that were on the docks. And my father was in the hold of a ship downriver, was thrown to the, uh, to the bottom of the ship, and then he spent the next uh, two or three weeks walking the site uh, of the explosion, and he never talked about it. Uh, it was a, a war zone. And I remember when I was in the National Park Service, I ran into uh, the superintendent of, uh, of uh, John Muir, Rosie the Riveter, Eugene O'Neill, and Port Chicago. There are several parks that are stitched together. And I happened to mention that my father uh, had been at Port Chicago and he said, uh, would you mind if I contacted your dad? Well, my dad is he, very garrulous. He, he would, I said, sure, here's his phone number. And that was the end of it. I never thought a thing about it after that. Well, the Park Service has a, for the historians and the anthropologists and everybody, there's a special magazine that comes out and somebody called me on the phone a couple of years later and they said, are you related to a guy named Ignatius Vori? And I, I said, well, yeah, that's my dad. They said, well, there's a picture of your dad in the magazine this month. And sure enough, there was my dad. They contacted him and did an oral history with him. And then they published all these memories in the magazine. It was pretty cool. Wow. Great story. <laughs> yeah. Great story. <laughs> So this is Guard. Can you hear me? We can. Yep. Hi, Guard. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, I just go. My my father's uncle, and we called him Old Uncle Dave. That's John Sundstrom's brother, David. Uh, received a Purple Heart in France in World War One, and <clears throat> I am in possession of that Purple Heart interesting and on his grave site uh, at the valley cemetery it just it says ph military <clears throat> yeah uh, he lost his eye uh, in battle <clears throat> he's buried in the the cemetery here uh correct the valley cemetery yeah david the valley. Uh, Wow. Yeah, yes. He was uh, a little story about that. He he was in the Forest Service in Zigzag, Oregon, and he died. So my Uncle Fred, if you know Uncle Fred, took a pickup to Zigzag and put David's body in the pickup and drove him back to Friday Harbor for burial. Oh, my God. <laughs> You go to jail for that. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been more common then. <laughs> it might have been. <laughs> uh, my, but my father, Clyde, he was in the Pacific and uh, on, a, on a Navy ship, and he never talked about it. And, you know, we didn't think at the time to grill him, if you will, of what happened. <clears throat> I, I will say I, I remember guard at your dad's funeral. It was an open casket and he was dressed in his uniform and he was a sight to behold. He was, it was really moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we see, we have a wonderful picture of him and Uncle Wade uh, in the military uniforms in New York City. Uh, they were on separate ships, and some I don't know how they know they didn't have cell phones. Somehow they knew they were in the same port together, and they they made connection and um, traveled up the uh, as far as you could go in the um, Statue of Liberty. My dad talked; he did talk about that. <clears throat> We have a wonderful, beautiful picture of Wade and Clyde in uniform in New York City. Nice. Could you talk about making alcohol on the ship? I mean, Dad mentioned that a little bit. So, <laughs> you know, we talked about extra... we talked about uh, Tilly Rossler, uh, Tilly and Rudolph, who took in Mildred. But uh, Clyde told me a great story about Tilly Guard. Uh, he said that he and uh, your Uncle Al and some of the other kids, they used to hang out at the feed store. And when Tilly would come up, they'd throw fruit at her because she could cuss better than anybody on the island. <laughs> to be true. <laughs> oh. Uh. Well, him and my uh, Del Flynn, they cussed a lot. Andy uh, Buchanan, my, my mom wouldn't let pe us kids downstairs if uh, Andy Buchanan came in the house. And... <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like Pat Sandwich, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, well, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, really for for uh, joining us and, and telling these great stories. And, and uh, thank you, Robin. That was just a wonderful way to lead off. And I, I just really appreciate the program. So, Hi, Bill. Hi, Francis. Hi, Dave. I was going to say, Mr. Hackett is my mom's cousin, the one that died. Yes. Mm. Oh. Because um, all the Hempfield, there's a lot of Hempfield girls, and um, one of them, I, I don't recall her name, Mary Hackett, and that's their son. Uh, it was Elizabeth was Gard. Elizabeth Gard. Was that? Yeah. Is that where it was? Uh, yep. She got, well, he died before my mom was even born, so. Hmm. Oh, it wasn't the Hempfield, that it was a guard. Sorry yes. about that. That's okay. You, you have a lot of those people in your family. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's understandable you would be confused sometimes. Many branches to that. Yeah. There's Mary Thank there you. too. Hi, Mary. <laughs> okay. Bye, Robin. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Have a this good is evening. fun. Bye. Thank you, Boyd. Thank you, Robin. Yeah.